Hey everybody, Pete A. Turner, executive producer and host of the Break It Down Show. We've got a hell of an episode for you guys today. My buddy Mike Van Story is a co-producer. He's a lifelong friend of mine, and he said, hey, I know a World War II vet, and I think you should have him on the show. And so we did. His name is Chet Roan, and he was in the 11th Armor, and that's part of the unit that helped break through at the Battle of Bastogne. And you're going to hear his memories and his recollections. Chet is over 95 years old. And he is just such a delight to be around. He's just heard and seen everything. And I'm so proud to be able to share him as a liberator, as a warrior, and just truly an American treasure. And there's a neat story that goes within all of this. So Mike says, hey, let's get this guy Chet. And of course, I say yes, as a World War II veteran, I'd I'd be honored to tell this story. And it just so happens that Andy Biggio, the guy who's writing the book, The Rifle, and we'll definitely tell you more about Andy later on, but remember that name, Andy and uh, Scott Husing, he's an award-winning author and a producer on the show as well. Uh, They were having a trip with a bunch of World War II veterans back to the Battle of the Bulge for the 75th anniversary of the fight. And I asked Chet, I said, Chet, you were at the Battle of the Bulge. Are you going on this trip? And he's like, I don't know about it. And so we were able to connect Chet to Andrew Biggio and we, we got Chet's on an airplane right now coming back from that trip at the Battle of the Bulge. We got to put his, his feet on that battlefield one last time. And it was, it was a super exciting thing for him to do. And, and we're awfully proud that all of the pieces impossibly fell together to have that. Look, all these World War II guys have incredible stories. Chet is among them. I mean, just the fact that they liberated concentration camps, and you can see it still makes them emotional, and, and it's hard to have that conversation and not be emotional yourself. You guys are going to love, love, love this episode. Okay, so uh, I'm going to be really short. You guys know what to do. Support the show, and listen, save the brave, save the brave.org. We can always slow down and take time for charity, so let's do that. Do your, if you're going to do your annual giving here at the end of the year, think about us. It can be a boat. It can be stock options. It can be cars. It can be land. Whatever it is, we'll find a way to put that to use to help these veterans and, and save some lives. Savethebrave.org. Do me a favor and join us in supporting. Okay. Here comes, well, here comes Chet Roan, and you're about to hear a crazy story. Lions Rock Productions. <laughs> This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. This is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morata. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hey, this is Chet Rowan, and you're listening to The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Chet is an American treasure. He's a liberator, and he's my hero. And I'm already getting emotional. <laughs> I also have Alec, his grandson, sitting here. Chet is one of the uh, magical World War II people, not magical, improbable, impossible, that are still with us and have all these incredible tales to tell. And uh, your war, at least part of the World War II part of it, probably to me, and I think to all of humanity, is, is the liberating of the uh, concentration camps you know, that you've got to participate in. So... We'll for sure get into that, but just from all of us in humanity, thank you for what you've done. It's remarkable. I don't know. Man, 50 million others, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, I mean, you all play your own small part in something that, you know, and a lot, like we were talking about the Battle of the Bulge, you know, that barely goes our way. Two or three things don't break our way, and that, that's a different fight, different outcome. Biggest battle of the Americans have ever been in. Yeah. And how close did we come to losing that fight? Hey, this is P. Day Turner from the Break It Down Show, checking in real quick to ask you this. John, Scott, and I all support Save the Brave with our time, our location, our effort, and our money. Each month, we give a small amount. Do the same with us. Go to SaveTheBrave.org, click on the Donate tab, pick an amount that you want to come out each month, and they will handle all the rest. I stand behind these folks. Thank you so much. Let's get back to the show. And how close did we come to losing that fight? Very close. Right. Very close. Yeah. You know, it was so damn cold. Yeah. Oh, my God. Now, I don't know. Did you have cold in Afghanistan or not? Oh, yeah. Or or hot? Well, yes, both. Both. But I had the the horror. The coldest I ever have been was in Afghanistan, Uh for sure. I lived on Hoth. Well, we were were well below zero for quite a while in the bulge. Yeah. 
and then you're outside the whole time, or were they able to pull you back and warm you up anywhere? I guess once or twice you had a little warmer. See, we, you couldn't dig. Okay. The frost line was five feet deep. Right. There was no such thing as it was. There were foxholes. If you blew a, you throw a grenade or something, and right. you might be able to dig a little. But you were moving too much. We found some German holes that we used. Yeah. But I have never been so cold for so long yeah. in my life. How did you take that? How, I mean, look, you're from Wisconsin, so you've got some cold stuff built oh, in yeah. you. But... Oh, yeah. But, well, we didn't have the kind of footwear we should have had. Right. Uh, we had, I don't know what it was you call it, it was a shoe that came up r- around here and you flipped it over. Around your calf, yeah. But okay. It was like a shoe boot. Uh-huh. But... Uh, you know, when it went down to 20 or 30 below zero yeah, for, for days, you just didn't stay warm. So surviving in that environment, you guys have to, uh, you have to do all of the things you have to do. You have to eat, you have to make waste, you have all these things, but you're also moving. Did you have warm food at all during the, during the battle? I'm trying to think. Not very often. Right. Not very often. Most of it was uh, K-rations or... Yeah. You know, stuff like that. Tell the audience what K-rations are. <laughs> a bunch of crap. <laughs> well, everything everything was just concentrated food, I guess. I don't, I don't even remember what it was. Yeah. I mean, it was something to eat, but it wasn't very really good. Yeah. And then, and sea rations. Did you, did you ever have seas? I've had sea rations, and you didn't want them. <laughs> K-rations uh, are worse. That was the point I'm getting at is you guys are living as hard as a human can yeah. and then being fed K rations. Yeah, we didn't even Christmas we didn't get anything, you know. It was crappy food all the time. Right. All right. the time. You know, they were supposed to be flying turkeys and we got all this <laughs> stuff they were gonna do for Christmas. I think I had a cold turkey dinner or something. We were on the move all the time. Yeah. With an armored division, you didn't sit which was good. I didn't want to sit in one spot all the time. On the other hand, at times in the bulge, you know, I'd be on guard one time for 24 hours without moving. Yeah. In zero weather, and my feet, I found an old box to get my feet up because there was ice below them. And I sat in that damn hole, the German hole. Right. And I sat in that hole. Luckily, I had a buddy because I was a machine gunner. So I had my assistant gunner. Sure. And uh, he's in some of these pictures here. But all I can think of was cold. I had one shower in the middle of a field in sub-zero weather. <laughs> and they pulled a, they had put a thing like a tent open on top. Yeah. They just wrapped tent material. Guy would be up on a step ladder with a with a big thing, and he said, "Okay, you ready?" And boom! So you got that. Okay, soap up, and thirty seconds later, okay, you all ready? Here comes another warm water on you, and then you got out out of this tent, and you know the wind was blowing and everything, and it was twenty below zero. Yeah. And and you're trying to dry yourself all oh my god. Yeah, better not to have the shower. We had tremendous number of frostbite. Yeah. The people are just you know, they're freezing their feet, freezing their their fingers. You never saw them again. What unit were you in? Eleventh Armored Division. Eleventh Armored Division. Yeah. And when did you join them? I joined them not in the States. We went to, to England first. And I guess that's where we must have joined them. But we spent three months in England. Okay. We had no equipment. They took all our equipment away. And we thought, what's going on now? Why aren't we going on? You heard of the fillets gap? Yes. I guess there's just there's so many people died in that thing. Yeah. And so much material was, was shot. Right. They took all our tanks. They took all our trucks. Took all our peeps. You know. Yeah. All the equipment. All our artillery, we actually had nothing. I didn't even have a rifle in England for three months. <laughs> we sat there. I'm, I didn't mind it because I got to London every weekend on a pass. Yeah. 
And the rest of it, we would sat in a Quonset hut gambling. Right. You know, it's on Playing some cards. Earl's estate. They yeah. put, it was about 100 miles north of London. I wasn't mad about it because I got to go to London every sure. weekend. Yeah. I just get on the train. I'm kind of a history buff, so I knew what I wanted to see. Sure. And I wasn't going to play cards or shoot craps all day. Yeah. But I went almost every weekend. In fact, I even bought a bike. Each two of us would buy one bike. We were gonna we were gonna bike in London because you had these uh, train cars for bikes. Right. Put them on and get there. I got to London. And I said, "Well, look, we, we, here's what we want first. Where is that? Well, that's 15 miles over this way. See? Okay. Where's the other one? Well, that's 20 miles over that way. Yeah. London is probably the biggest city in yeah. the area in the world. Not up. Yeah. Why? Spread wide. out. Yeah. Well, I'd, I never took a bike back to London. I wasn't going to spend all my time, you know, pedaling. Pedaling. <laughs> you know, they had the underground there. Yeah. So I could get from one place to another. So when you know history, you don't want to shoot dice and play cards. What did you want to see in London when you were there? And what impressed you that you maybe were surprised? Well, everything. I everything. mean, a changing of the guard. Yeah. Madame Tussauds, uh, waxwork, uh, old castles. Yeah. I love, love that. Yeah. I'm just a kind of a history buff, so right. I knew about all the places I wanted to go. Yeah. Or I read about them, but of course never been there. So did you land at Normandy then, at, at D-Day? Let's see. Yes. We landed at the same place where the invasion, we landed after the invasion. Okay. Uh, what's the name of the town? Normandy no, or, or it, where, I don't know. Is it a little town place? there. Let's well, no, same it. same place, same place, the, same part. But you, so you didn't go with the initial wave. You were like D Day plus two or something like that that they pushed you guys no, through. It was D Day plus two, three months. Oh, okay. <laughs> so D Day sixty or something. Yeah. I didn't get over there till December. Oh, okay. D Day was what May, June? June. Yeah, right. Yeah, mm -hmm. I said we were in London all that time. That we thought we couldn't understand why we had to go over. It was they didn't have the equipment. Yeah, yeah. They had shot up so much of our armor right. that we had nothing left. I guess the lieutenant had a peep to run around in, but we had no tanks. Yeah. We, I was on a half track during the war, no half tracks. Right. I wasn't bitching. I wasn't that. Sure. When I knew what was happening over in at the fillet and around yeah. there, and um, no. So I am I right in thinking then that, so December you come across the channel and you catch up at the unit and basically you catch up at the Battle of the Bulge. I guess. Yes. Okay, right. good. Yeah. You're like, welcome. We have no food. We have no <laughs> well, here's what happened. We yeah. got there. Being an armored division, we were going to crack the German fort and German emplacements along the channel. Okay. They were servicing all their submarines. Mm hmm our infantry divisions could not crack those. So they said, okay, we're going to use an armored division. And I forgot the names of the towns where all the Germans were, mm -hmm. even after the front had moved. Right. There were still thousands of Germans along the channel right. and other places. That's what we thought we were going to do. And then one day, it was a couple of weeks after we hit the beach, there's some trouble over in Belgium. Oh, what's that? You yeah. Know? We ran, it took us three days and three nights to get from the coast to uh, Belgium with everything. Now we were, of course, re-outfitted. We had right. all the equipment. And uh, we moved night, night and day, but you can only go as fast as the slowest vehicle, sure. obviously. So it was one long, cold ride. We got into the bulge at about midnight. On that ride? Yeah. Were you sitting in the back of a truck? Were you Where were you sitting? In the rear end of a half track. I was a rear, rear machine gunner. Okay. So with you, a post mount. Yeah, okay. And we had a front mount. We had a 50. Right. I had a World War One tube. You know, what do you call the, the old type tube uh -huh. with water? Yeah. Never put water in it. You put a frozen solid. Yeah. It was too cold for water. So yeah. I had to learn to shoot 
past burps uh-huh. because the barrel was only as big as a rifle barrel in right. the machine gun. Yeah. And that thing could, you know, if you held that, oh, yeah. you'd shoot maybe 30 rounds, it'd freeze up. Yeah. So all the shooting I did was burp, burp, burp. Yeah. Most of which was not a German troops, although we did shoot up a number of German troops, but an awful lot of shooting at airplanes. Mm. Okay. Uh, Messerschmitts, if, when we, if we were moving in column, those ME-109s would come over. Right. And they're flying fools. They flew between the trees. Wow. Those guys were, well, they come over me. They were no more than 15 feet above my head. Good grief. That is low. And yeah. I get, get maybe a one or two second burst. So I had to learn to watch yeah. The tracers from our guys back, you know, and we knew they were coming. We we could hear our the machine guns at you know, two, three, four miles away. Right. And we could see tracers even in the day. Yeah. And I watched the tracers. When the tracers started coming back, I started shooting. Yeah. Because that's when I was got my two seconds in. Yeah. And uh it worked that way because they had to fly through my like, Yeah. And I knew if I was hitting them because my um, the tracers would bump would jump off, you know, and the and they didn't go pr- penetrate, but they would bounce off the German planes. Right. Then I knew my I used armor piercing. Mm-hmm. I lo- loaded all my own belts. Okay. Okay. So I had a lot of practice shooting in planes, and the Germans once in a while our column would shoot them down that way. Yeah. I know I hit coming on one of those planes, but I never never knew if I I hit one in a vital spot because they're gone, you know. Yeah. They're coming at three hundred miles an hour. Yeah. Fifteen feet above you. And you're what? You're ten feet off your head is ten feet off the ground in the back of that half track. So that plane's twenty five feet off the ground, going three hundred miles About, an hour. Yeah. So yeah. those guys I, must and they I didn't fly standing, the, you know. We never sat on the seats of a half track. We sure. sat on the edges. Right. And the edge was about this wide. Your feet were on the seat. Mm-hmm. And then all your belongings were down Down where below. your feet would yeah. normally be. And I kept a couple of extra machine guns down there. We would raid things. You know, I had maybe three machine guns back there. Yeah. They weren't ready, but in case something happened to mine, I had another one there. Right. We usually carried at least 100 or some 200 pounds of TNT. And so if we'd ever been hit, there would have been a... A, a big hole in the road. Boom. Yeah. Yeah. And when you guys are on this movement to catch up to the unit, you're going through three days, three nights. I'm familiar with all this. It is mind numbingly boring. You know, it is sitting there and driving 10 miles an hour or 15 miles an hour because that's about as fast as we could go. I don't know yeah. about you guys, but. Well, we could go only as fast as the slowest vehicle. Right. And how fast was that? That vehicle's broken usually. And like, it was an awful lot of stop and go. Yeah. And, of course, you had to keep your intervals. We were always 100 feet from the interview uh, for the next vehicle in front of us and 100 feet from the one behind us. Right. So, this, you know, not too many would get wiped out. Maybe yeah. one would. I didn't like the fact that we had that all that TNT in because there yeah. would have just been a hole in the road if that ever went off. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that's what we did. Yeah. And, uh, they, boy, these Germans were flying fools. Yeah. Once in a while, we get them. My buddy and my squad, we got one plane, and we were in a, in a big, big U-turn that went for a couple miles like that, mm-hmm. and there were a lot of open spaces, and this guy flew right into that. He evidently didn't realize how many guns were going to be on him. Is that a I'll bet there right? were... 20 or 30 machine guns on you. Did you guys worry about friendly fire by shooting, like following your tracers, and or was it? Occasionally. Yeah. I mean, we had artil- artillery going over our heads all the time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, of course, we welcomed that, you know. Sure. Makes that could help us. Yeah. But if you had a short round, and it could be bad. Yeah. Did you guys wear hearing protection at all? No. Uh-uh. Yeah. I, I don't know how any of you guys can hear. That's... <laughs> It's so bad. The only thing I did wear, and I'll show you, and of course we had to keep our steel helmets on. Right. But I found this, and it worked. I could get my my steel helmet. That's German Army issue. So he's pulling and, out a, 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 it's a rabbit fur? 
Or yeah, well, I of, think it is. Yeah, rabbit I, fur. Well, I feel it. It's fur. Yeah. Well, I think it was rabbit's fur, and of course, this is the Vermont colors. Right. But we wore, if I wore it like this, I could jam my my helmet over the top I of it. I would not have survived that winter yeah. without this. Yeah. I found this somewhere in the bulge. Yeah. And I'm glad we weren't captured because it's got the German emblem and everything. I yeah, I saw I that. Yeah. Captured can I, can with, uh, you know, German stuff on. Yeah. It looks like uh, LeBeau's hat from Hogan's Heroes, if you remember that. But, but with He's getting kind of kind of smelly. It's getting kind of smelly. You've got a, a German emblem with the no, eagle got, on it and everything. And so yeah. this kept your head warm. Which is oh a, my ears too yeah your ears too yeah because the metal helmet didn't didn't uh, yeah. really cover your ears and that in that helmet is it just straps no we never could use the straps oh, okay we had you had an inner helmet okay and an outer one the inner helmet used the chin strap went over the lip of the this way and then the other strap went over that way yeah so you had to get these two helmets strapped together so. But uh, you didn't wear them because if there was a big explosion near you, could break your neck if you had a chin right. strap. Right. We never wore them. Just right. wore it. But it stayed on. You found this along the road or whatever, like at a stop or something like that? and just Houses. Got... I, well, you know, we, we were looters. Yeah, yeah, you got to be. Yeah. And if there was ever a house, we all ran in to see what they got, what goodies. Yeah, I have got you know I got a German rifle here, and uh, I got shotguns from uh, castles. We took you know yeah when there was anything, it was first come first serve. Got, yeah, and I've got a whole German uniform. Wow, and so I've used that. In fact, I tried to go to a military ball in University of Wisconsin. Yeah, after the war, we thought, well, let's wear. We could wear our uni army uniform, but one guy had an 1812 uniform. He put that on, and he got into mill ball. But I had a German uniform, and I yeah. got as far as the door. No, they said no thanks. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. So, okay, uh, you move for 36 hours. You catch up at the Battle of the Bulge. And then, like, what's your, what's your in-brief? And they're like, all right, glad that you guys are here head over that way or like you know did like when did you know the situation you were getting into like and how dire it was i guess it was just because of what we did we didn't know what was going to happen mm -hmm. but i had to spend almost every night trying to get teller mines on mm -hmm. as engineers that was our job right so if the tanks were going to use such and such a road two in the morning we go there mm -hmm. one squad at a time and we were not allowed to blow the mines. We had to tear, take them off. Wow. And we could hear that German truck two blocks ahead of us yeah. throwing these out and let the snow. Yeah. But that's what we did a lot of taking out mines. It was just a scary job. Yeah. And we'd hear the German patrols going by us. Sometimes they'd be talking. You know, they might have been 50 feet away. We you, we didn't move, you know. Right. And no talking. Right. Or whisper, yeah. you whisper to somebody, and we had intervals of 15 feet usually, hoping they didn't find. All we had were rifles with us. And you guys are on your, so you're on foot on your own. With rifles. With rifles. No mounted machine guns, right. nothing. Right, right. But we would have to take, let's say, a mile or two at, at uh, crack, and then they'd have other engineers yeah. do the other did an awful lot of that. You couldn't bury them. I mean, everything, the ice was so thick and the frost line so deep. And there was no digging. Yeah. They just put them, it was snowing half the time. Right. So these are German teller mining. You've probably seen those. Yeah, yeah. Know? They're about this big and that thick. Yeah, like a big pizza. So they had all had handles and we'd find them. Only thing we did, we'd gradually get under them. We want to make sure there's not attached to a second mine. Mm. Germans did that. Right. There was a well in the bottom that they could put a mm -hmm. firing device in. So if there was no firing device, we would very gingerly pull those things off. And we weren't allowed to, to well, blow yeah. them because 
supposedly the Germans didn't know where we were. Right. Well, we knew where the Germans were. I think they knew where we were. Pretty good idea, right. And then did, I know that job is dangerous and scary, but did the mines go off at times or were you guys, so you guys were pretty fortunate with that? Uh, we were fortunate. Yeah. yeah. There were some guys that I we got blown up yeah. with them. Yeah. Supposedly you could stand on a teller mine. I wasn't going to try it. They told us, you know, uh, your weight isn't enough to do it. Yeah. And that's probably true. That's not tested. This is made for a tank going over or a truck or, yeah. you know, something heavy. But I wasn't going to test them. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Battle of the Bulge, terrifying. And you guys finally are able to break through. What happened? Where'd you guys go next? What happened? Well, let's see. The bulge lasted, I think it was five weeks, okay. roughly. But how much sleep did you get on a day during the Battle of the Bulge? I don't remember. Yeah. I mean, you slept for 10 minutes here and 20 minutes there. Okay. If you, if you were lucky enough, you know. Right. And just curl up on the ground, right? Like you weren't in a cot or anything. On the ground, you couldn't dig. So we would look for brush or something like that. Yeah. And so there's my old sleeping bag, not the army issue. I bought this at a PX. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you ever saw what the army issued you. Yeah. You went into it. You've seen Egyptian mummies. Yeah, yeah. You went into it. You laced it from inside. Can you imagine trying to get out of that no. thing? No, no. <laughs> I we threw ours away. We never took them overseas. So I bought this. It didn't give much help. I could get an army blanket, a thin one, in it. But, and then I had to sleep with my rifle inside. Right. Yeah. And my boots inside because yeah. they would freeze up. Yeah. So you were just jammed in this thing. Yeah. And all was cold. Cold, cold, cold. Yeah. yeah. I know when I slept in those cold environments, all of my clothes would go up towards where my face hole would be. And I curled up like a cat inside just so that my own bad breath would heat me up. You and know? Where, what were you in? This, just like a regular army sleeping bag, you know? But yeah. it's, it's kind of a mummy sack, but a little so more you, spacious. You probably had better ones. Oh, ones for sure. That they gave us at first. We wouldn't go in. The new one has, when I was in, the newest one was a thin summer and then a, a fatter second bag. Did you have a zipper? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No we more no laces. zippers. Yeah. Can you imagine? Yeah. The house had snaps, so you could snap it up if you wanted. That was the fastest. Ours, in, in 20 minutes, you could get out of it. Yeah. No way. I never, well, never slept in it. There are three parts to the bag that I used. So there was the summer bag, the winter bag that would go around that, and then there was an outer waterproof layer. Oh, my. <laughs> That's all I had, yeah. and I bought it at the PUX. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what we did. Well, of course, we the first thing we do is look for evergreens. Yeah. And we used our bayonet. That okay. was the only way we used the bayonet was slashing every night. Get as many pine branches as you could under yeah. you. Because you got to get the cold off, get off the ground. Yeah. That frost line was so deep. Yeah. It's just sleeping on ice, you know. Yeah. So you you would get little cat naps though for the most yeah, part, and you took your boots off, but you left them in there because yeah. if you left them outside, Froze. you'd never get them on in the morning. They'd be frozen, so so stiff. Right, right. There wasn't much room after you get your army boots, yeah, in there and your rifle. Yeah, right. Right. I was we were all afraid the moving parts would freeze. Yeah, I mean that oil could freeze, you know. For sure. I thought, you know, I don't want my rifle to freeze up. Yeah. I might need it. <laughs> you would need it. Yeah. yeah. As soon as you did. And then how often did you have to change socks? Because I know like, I, you know, as long as I kept changing my socks, my feet stayed pretty good. Well, we changed it, but not often enough. Okay. I didn't have enough socks. Never had clean ones, but dirty ones. Sure. Yeah. You know. Rotate them. Yeah. I, never, I slept with the boots on in my, in that. But on the other hand, I, we didn't any want any more because if we were overrun by the Germans, I didn't want to be running naked through the fields when it's 20 below zero. Yeah. Yeah. So I might have had to run in bare feet. I hoped I didn't and I didn't. Yeah. I've never been so cold. And and I mean, I'm used to cold. Yeah. You're from I used Wisconsin. to skate to school in, <laughs> in Wisconsin. Right. The roads were never all plowed in the middle. And, uh, 
we had ice all the time. So I was used to skating and all that. But uh, to try and operate, and, and then it got in one place, it got to 40 below. Jesus. Most of mine, ours was 20 below. Yeah. But uh, and all that's I remember it is oh, cold, yeah. cold, cold. Yeah. And your fingers, you know what they gave us? I don't know if you ever saw the original Army mitts. Yeah. Okay. That's what they were like. Yeah. You could get one finger, in a big heavy, you know. Yeah. These two fingers are going this one, and then your thumb. He's showing a, a like a, a three-fingered glove, and the pinky sticks out, and the thumb sticks out, and then you have the other three together. I could not get this through the trigger housing of my rifle. Mm. Yeah. So what I did is I did, I, this hand was out in the cold all the time. Right. Because I'm right-handed. And... The other one, I did have my big mitt on. Yeah. We had to massage our hands, massage our feet all the time. Yeah. Uh, it was, they called trench foot. Yeah. And I don't know if that was like frozen feet or what, but a lot of guys went to the hospital fast. Yeah. They froze their feet. It was miserable. It sounds just, miserable. just miserable conditions. I mean, finally, you know, it changed, it changed, but... For December and January and February. Hard living. Good Lord. Yeah. Our army wasn't set up to be in the Battle of the Bulge. I right. Get, as far as clothing. So, okay. Battle of the Bulge happens. You guys say nuts. You're not going to give up. You keep fighting. And then you ultimately win the Battle of the Bulge. And that's in January. Is that right? End of January. End of January. Yeah, it start, no, it started in December 16th. And it was the last week of January, we finally got them on the run and kicked them out of there. But I never want to be that cold again. It was just, there were guys sent to the hospital, you never saw them again. Frozen yeah. feet, frozen fingers, frozen hands. You kept massaging them every night. Uh, well, they made you do it, too. You had to take your boots off and massage your feet. Yeah. Get the circulation going. Yeah. I don't remember ever being warm. Right. I remember being not quite as cold. Yeah. If I had enough junk in there. And then we would put pine boughs over us sometimes. Yeah. So when I was in Afghanistan, I was on a very cold camp and uh -huh. there was ice everywhere. Right. But we stayed on a camp. So when it would snow, we'd all walk on the snow and pack it into yeah. ice. And so what would happen is, is um, it was like a, like an ocean almost. So there was no flat surface. And so you'd walk and then you would, the longest winter, the battle of the bulge. Yes. Snow and ice. Snow and ice. We fell down all the time. This is what I'm getting at. Like you'd walk slowly and carefully, but the ice was such that you would just slip, bam, and fall all the time. Did you guys have a lot of that where you were just constantly getting slipping well, on the you're, ice. Well, usually you're wading through snow. Snow, okay, so you still had snow. And okay. the ice down below. Yeah. Sure, we fell, I'm sure. But uh, what you had to do is keep moving. Yeah. Or your circulation. We got on a Siegfried line, and we were so short-handed. We just, you know, no army plans for something like the Battle of the Bulge. Right. So, everybody was on the guard all the time. Yeah. You never got to sleep. Now, at least I had a buddy. Yeah. My I was, my assistant gunner sat and froze next to me. Yeah. So, I had somebody to talk to. Right. But one night, they put us on the perimeter. Well, they gave us many too many yards for a, one platoon to handle. Yeah. We weren't anywhere close to our next guys. Mm. And sergeant says, look, I'm sorry, I'll get back to you when I can. That was uh, 3.30 or something in the afternoon. We weren't relieved until 4 the next morning or something like right. that. It's a long time. So you sat there. I had an old old box or something. It was a German Yeah. Thing. Luckily, I didn't have to carve it. But my feet were up on that wooden box, and you didn't move for 24 hours. Right. Yeah. I know you're on guard, so you're alert, but how scared, how tense are you when you're on guard in that situation? 
Well, you're always tense okay. up there. Yeah. I mean, the Germans were darn good fighters. Right. And they would attack at night as well as during the day, and we did too. But you never knew if they were crawling up. At night, the first thing you did was make sure you knew where each tree was. Mm -hmm. Because later on, that tree was a moving thing. You know? Yeah, yeah. Did you take out your iPhone and take a picture of the tree line? That's just a joke. Um, <laughs> So yeah. you, you, and your assistant gunner are there. You know, you know your fields of fire. You've memorized the trees and all that kind of thing. What are you guys talking about? How do you pass the time? Food, <laughs> girls, girls, yes, family. Yeah, you exhausted every subject you could, right? Because you're trying to stay awake. Yeah, when you don't have any anybody relieving you, you're scared. You know. Yeah. Well, we didn't know where the next guys were. They, we knew they were somewhere within 100 feet, probably. Yeah. Couldn't hear them or anything. Right. And guys were, you know, the Germans were devils. They'd sneak up with grenades or something. And I'll tell you, I know those trees were moving. Yeah. You, you'd see somebody said, Who's, is that moving, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so Battle of the Bulge ends. You guys are going towards you know, towards the end of the war, but how many more big fights did you get in? Because it doesn't take that well, long. They were, yeah. they were all night fights. Uh-huh. And all the, at no more than platoon strength and most of the time squads. Right. It'd be quick and over with, you know. Yeah. Uh, you did a lot of praying. <laughs> yeah. You exhausted. At least I had a guy to talk to. Right. Some of those poor guys were sitting by themselves for 24 hours. Wow, yeah. I mean, you go batty. Yeah. And everything, you swear it's moving after a while. Sure. You look and, you know, was that a tree? No. That looks like somebody just sneaking up on yeah. you. You couldn't sleep. And I know, for me, if I'm awake for, say, 25 hours, I start to hallucinate. And I don't know that I'm hallucinating right away. And then I go, okay, I've, any, anything I think I see, and, and when I say hallucinate, I've seen someone walk in front of me, I waved at them and they waved back. And then my friend's like, what are you doing? Who are you waving yeah. at? And I'm like, yeah. a guy didn't just walk by? Yeah. So it's fully, you don't know you're hallucinating at first. You swear a tree or a bush was moving. Yeah. I said, who is, did you see that? Yeah. Well, sure, we had a machine gun, but we weren't supposed to fire. If, if you can imagine, because yeah. that would give away what we were doing or where yeah. we were. That was the most miserable time in my army was, was that battle of the boat. Just yeah. miserable. Yeah. Uh, there were no saving features. You were always cold. You were always hungry. You didn't have hot food. Right. You mean try and eat, you know, some of the food was so tough it was frozen. Bottle your water bottle would freeze Froze. up. Yeah, it was just absolute misery. Everybody just hated every minute of it. After the battle, and you're on the road, you have these small skirmishes. How often are you getting warm chow during that time? Are you ever getting warm rations at all? Well, you didn't do much travel. Mm -hmm. If you did, it was usually during the day okay when you could see and you knew what was going on we had the tactical air force mm -hmm. helping to us you know yeah if air german planes were coming our guys could get some planes pretty soon yeah. not in the middle of the night but during the day once we were moving it didn't bother me too much we were always cold everybody was cold yeah. i didn't even have long johns my mother sent me some long johns and I wore them so long, and I rubbed on the calf of my legs. So I had big sores that went right through the underwear. Yeah. And the scab would be on the outside of that damn underwear. Wow. Because it's rubbing on you. Yeah. And I'd have that on. Well, as I say, I had one shower in the Battle of the Bulge. The next time I had a bath was in a house alongside the Rhine River. Yeah. And that's all for the whole damn war. Two, we were two. <laughs> we were God. dirty. Yeah. We were our faces were just black. 
Yeah. But, you know, we were all in the same boat. Yeah, for you sure. Know, we were all complaining, but what can you do? Huh? I lived on the side of a mountain in Afghanistan for a while with like a, a big platoon. Yeah. You know, like a heavy platoon. And water was rationed because we were running off of a well. And, you know, just there wasn't enough water. Yeah. And so you didn't bathe very often. But the moment you did, you could smell how bad everybody else smelled. And so you're like, I'm just not going to shower because it just didn't, because well, you're all I in it together. I didn't have a shower. For, see, we got into the bulge in December. Yeah. And I, might, I didn't have a shower except what they gave us in the snow. Yeah. And ice until, until we found a bath on the Rhine River. Now, yeah. we were a long way from the Rhine River. Sure. It took us a couple of months just to get to the Rhine River. And we were lucked out. We found a house that had running water, which was unbelievable. Right. And so uh, I don't know what the, how we kept getting it, but it ran. Could you pick out that house today if you saw it, do you think? Would I know it? Yeah. It was a little old house right next to the river. Yeah. We couldn't cross because we only had so many bridges across. Okay. The Germans blew all the regular sure. bridges, so we had floating bridges. But when you get 10,000 men that want to cross at one point, yeah. it takes, it takes a long time, a long time with all their equipment. Yeah. So we were there for at least two or three days before our division got the okay. Yeah. But I don't think that bathtub was ever empty. Yeah. <laughs> oh, two the water would be too. black. Yeah. Luckily, we could get new water. We had a fire going. I mean, we had to keep the water hot. Yeah. We had a fire going on the system. There's a heater, a water heater. Yeah. But it was like heaven. Were any of the businesses open as you guys moved? Yeah, like, we went. like in the businesses, like the bakeries and the butcher shops, were any of those things open at all, or was all all closed down? Every time we went through, everything is buttoned up. You okay. Know? The civilians were hiding in the basements. Yeah. And they they took it on the chin, too, because sure. an awful lot of their houses were destroyed all right over them. Yeah, and their bathtub ruined. But there were just no stores. When did it start to occur to you that the Germans were uh, exterminating Jews? Well, I guess we got the Stars and Stripes maybe okay. once every two weeks or three weeks. And you read a little about it in that. Yeah. No other papers, except army paper. You heard stuff, you weren't sure if it was true. Right. And and what you heard, was it be, like was it impossible to even believe? Like, okay, yeah, maybe it's true, maybe it's not, but like, was was what you were reading, was it horrific? It was one of those gradual, until you, you didn't believe everything in the beginning. Yeah. And, but we came across a lot of slain civilians. We didn't kill them. Yeah. Why were they? Why were they dead? Yeah. Women, children, men weren't many men. They were all in the German army. Right. But families, they were either bombed out or machine gunned or something. I think the German. Now remember, these were different countries, so yeah. the Germans were killing civilians. I'm sure we must have killed some. Yeah. We sure our artillery certainly killed some. Sure. Uh, people, they had stone houses in Belgium. That some of them were five, six hundred years old. The same families, yeah, had those houses for five or six hundred. They were made of made of stone, which was great until artillery shattered them. Yeah, anything else that could burn, they burned. The barns burned. Dead animals, dead horses, everywhere. Yeah. We never saw civilians to any extent, mm -hmm. except if we hid in their basements once in a while, we'd yeah. see that family. I think the the civilians, the, the men were gone. They were dragooned into the German army, whether sure. they were German or not. Yeah. What about the Holocaust, Opie? Was the first time you, you learned about it really when you were at Mauthausen, or did you have some it, I think some it was before? a slow thing. You read about it. Some things you said, oh, it couldn't be that bad, you know. Right. You didn't see it right away. Occasionally you would see uh, 
dead civilians, but they got we killed as a lot of yeah. the civilians with our artillery. Yeah, I don't know. I I can't place because we saw dead, you know, civilians. But what were they selling? Were they killed by shells fire or a machine yeah. gun? I don't know. Right, could have been killed by ours. Yeah, you know, some of our guys. Remember one place on the side of a barn. There were guys, maybe ten guys. Boom, 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 boom. They weren't just killed there haphazardly. Yeah, they, they were, were lined, lined up, up and there were machine gun by the Germans. Right. We knew that. Uh, you heard horror stories. You didn't know if you could believe all of yeah. them. We heard about concentration camp. Heard about those before we even left the states. Right. But you didn't realize to what extent it was and how bad it was. When you guys got to Mauthausen area and you were going to liberate those, you know, the people that were in the concentration camp, did you know that was going to happen or did you just kind of drive up on Oh, no, it? we knew. Now, this was, Mauthausen was a long, long way from where we were in For Belgium. Sure. Yeah. Mauthausen was down in Austria. Right. Four or 500 miles away. To the south, yeah. We got there eventually, but. Uh, Why were you guys headed that way? Was that just your division's task? Well, uh, you know, whatever the front was, uh, that's the way you went. Okay. We thought we were going to Berlin until yeah. we turned right instead of left. Right. We're not going to Berlin. We're going down into Austria, which was called Ostmark mm -hmm. by the Germans. We'd capture prisoners and they'd say, where are you from? They'd say, Ostmark. I said, Eastreich. Yeah. You know, they were still calling it. Ostmark, which was the eastern province of Germany. Yeah. That's what it meant. Ostmark, yeah. And the Eastreich meant the kingdom of Austria. Right. Germany wouldn't have that. They are now like a state in Germany, all right. of Austria. So we captured a lot of Austrians who were in the German army. Mm -hmm. We captured a lot of Poles who were in the German army. Right. We captured just about from every little country. Yeah. But they were serving Germany, not by choice, but they were dragooned into right. it. Right. So talk to me about the concentration camp then. Tell me about that day. Well, I was a long way away. Sure. We, we started seeing dead for bed, dead people that we knew it was different. It wasn't dead soldiers. Mm -hmm. It was dead civilians. And an awful lot of them. We thought, no, they couldn't all have been killed. Especially when they saw them in a line. Yeah. They weren't just killed by artillery. So we gradually knew that the Germans were executing Civilians. the people in other countries. Right. There were, dex you know, there were dead everybody from countries all over the world. And we read a lot. I mean, the army was feeding us up. We didn't know how much was true or not. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we had a lot of stuff that wasn't true either sure. being fed to us. But it was a, a gradual thing. We had uh, hoisted a, a shortwave radio from the, our signal core. We stole it and put it in our, ca our half track. We could get BBC in London on it. So uh, we, we wanted it for the music. Yeah. Glenn Miller and all the rest. Right. Glenn Miller was killed, of course. But his drummer became head of his orchestra. Right. And he followed us all the way across Europe. And so we're listening to swing music on our half track and all that kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah. But what what about when you approached when you approached Mauthausen? What what was different about that as you were entering Mauthausen? Well, thirty miles before we got to Mauthausen, we started seeing striped people in the ditch dead. Mm -hmm. We'd go over and look at him and think, God almighty, this is a concentration camp prison. You know, shot in the back of his head. Yeah. They were marching these guys from Poland all the way down to Austria, over 400 miles. Yeah. Well, these guys died from freezing. They died from malnutrition, from everything you can imagine. Or they died just because the Germans shot them. Right. So we knew we were getting into a bad situation and we read about you know the army published stuff and but i'll tell you this until you got to it and saw it and, and smelled it it was a different story 
I mean, after all, there are a lot of dead soldiers everywhere. We saw dead Americans everywhere and dead German soldiers everywhere. It got to be that, you know, you sit next to them and eat your lunch. Mm. Very grave registration did not find all the guy, the dead. Right. In fact, we'd see them at night because as engineers, we ought to do a lot of night work. And these guys were taking the dead Americans, you know, by feet and the neck, one, two, three, throwing them up in the top of a big truck. Yeah. And we said, you do that again, I'm going to kill you. Yeah. You're not going to do that to American soldiers. Right. I'm sure as soon as we left, they did it again. But we almost shot some of our own soldiers because yeah. they were in graves registration. And we, you know, if I'm killed, I don't want to be handled the way they're doing it. Yeah. So all of these things you learn gradually. Now, we started the active war in December, but the war wasn't over till May. So, I mean, there was a lot of war in between. Most of our war was against armored troops, tanks. Hopefully we had our tanks there to help protect us, uh, or artillery. I remember one time we were building a bridge on Little River, and for some reason I had to go across this river. There was a broken bridge there. You could walk on it, but you couldn't drive it. So we were going to put a, a Bailey Bridge, I think it was, you ever, you know what a Bailey sure. is? Yeah. Big, heavy bridge. Take 20 guys to haul the members together. It was, mm -hmm. most of our bridges were little treadways. Yeah. You know, for a 15-foot bridge or something like that. So for some reason, I went over on the broken old bridge, and I was over there by myself. Maybe 500 yards away, a tiger tank came over a hill. Oh. And it looked to me as big as a house. I mean, their tigers were up in the 80,000 yeah. tons. Just, I mean, just huge. Our little old Sherman's 80, 3,200. Yeah. And finally, some of the bigger ones, the, the, we started getting the, um, they named it after our general, after it was a T-45 or something, which yeah. looked to us really huge. Then you saw a tiger. Their tracks, their tracks were this wide. That's like three Ours feet wide. Ours were maybe this wide. 18 inches wide, yeah. And these things looked, when I saw this thing on the move, they weren't going to waste, weight. they weren't going to waste cannon on me. Yeah, right. But when you're alone and you see this damn thing coming over a hill. Yeah. I got back across the other, that damn old bridge. Fast. Fast as I could. Yeah. I didn't know what they were going to do. We got into, you know, a, a lot of tank, middle of tank battles because we fought with the tanks. Right. And we had to act not as engineers, but as infantry a lot of Dismounted times. Dismounted infantry, sure. And we were very short-handed yeah. in, in some cases. Yeah. Very, very. So... When you're on foot, any tank looks great big if it's not <laughs> yeah, yours. Yeah. I don't care what tank it is. Yeah. If you're out here by yourself and the rest of your buddies on the other side of a creek and something comes over a hill 500 yards away, uh, you take off if yeah. you're on foot. You guys liberate the camp, the concentration camp. Talk to me about that experience. What did, what did you see? What did you feel? Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. You guys liberate the camp, the concentration camp. Talk to me about that experience. What did, what did you see? What did you feel? We got there, we knew by this time there must have been camps. We had seen a lot of dead prisoners and right. striped, as were the last 20, 30 miles. And we knew that we've read about camps and things, and we said, holy mackerel, this is yeah. worse than we thought. We got down to Linz, and that was Hitler's favorite city. After the war, he was going to move government down there. Linz was now part of Germany. Right. 
and he was going to have his government buildings and all that. We saw so many dead people in these uniforms. We knew what the uniforms yeah. were, the striped uniforms. And we'd go and look at them in the ditches, you know, first by the dozens and then by the hundreds and finally by almost the thousands. These were people, they moved from Poland. Yeah. Those guys walked from Poland all the way down 450 miles. Yeah. And uh, to that area. And off, four, maybe half of them died on the way or were killed. Mm -hmm. If they couldn't keep up, they'd be shot. Yeah. Them. So we saw an awful lot of dead striped with striped uniforms on. Um, then I, I had never heard of Mauthausen until we got down there. Some guys said, hey, there's a big camp here. Some guys had been over there. And so we found out about it. And so the next day, um, I was able to get into Mauthausen. Um, I can't describe it. I have never seen so many dead people in one place. Right. Some of them stacked up like that. Others them in railroad cars with the doors open. You'd see the dead bodies in there. I don't know what they were doing with them. I mean, first it was bodies by the hundreds. Yeah. Then all of a sudden the bodies by the thousands. Yeah. And uh, the smell in the whole area was just terrible. Some of these guys have been dead for probably a month. Mm. So Eisenhower sent word, you know, everybody and our our general to uh, Pat, every guy, we want you, want him to see this, want him to get in the Mount House, and you've got to see it. We've taken it. Uh, the guards of the, were either killed or they were now run off. So I went in the day right after liberation. And I was interested to see it. I wanted, you know, what are they, mm -hmm. what was it like? Now, this was different than a lot of them because, as I say, the others were temporary type buildings, wooden buildings. Mauthausen was stone because the stone came right out of the quarry there. Sure. And it was building stone. So you had walls like this. It was like seeing a federal prison. Yeah. I just went on my own. So, I mean, after a while, we were just loose to do whatever we, what we wanted. So the the day after liberation, I said, well, I want to see that. So we took our half track over and just went in individually. All the prisoners were still there. Uh, some were alive. A good share were dead. Yeah. And then we started hearing the stories. They had English-speaking prisoners that could talk to us. And I had a guy that was a, I think he was with a newspaper, and I think a Czech newspaper. He could speak English as good as I could. Mm -hmm. And he took us around. I, I was with five other guys. We wanted to see it. They had a gas chamber. We were in the gas chamber. They had a... Uh, whatever you call it, where they dissect the guys. Mm -hmm. They would knock all the golden teeth out of them before they would burn them. Right. And the bodies, you know, there were so many dead bodies, they couldn't dispose of them. I'm talking 10,000 dead bodies wow. in there. We were shocked. We'd seen a lot of dead people during the war, but not that one, not, not that many that had just been machine gunned or whatever. By the hundreds, yeah, and, and the smell. Some of those guys have been dead for a month, I'm sure. I wanted to go into Mauthaus and see it first, but there was a guy. There was a barbed wire fenced open area out that side. So I was by myself. I just went over. I said, "Oh, I'm going to see it." And uh, there was a guy standing there, stark naked. Now, he was about a hundred. 200 feet from me. So I said, I'm going to talk to this guy. I want to find out what's going on. He was a fairly tall guy, didn't have any clothing on. And I walked up to him. You know, his eyes were open. I, said, I was going to talk to him. 
and I knew he couldn't see me. Hmm. He was just a blank stare, and yet he was standing, stark naked. His knees were like this. Down here was like this. Yeah. His <laughs> hips were huge. Around his, I could have put my fingers around his waist. Yeah. I mean, he was a dead man that was still alive. It was uh, just a horrendous thing. But what are the experience, the whole experience, from Battle of the Bulge to the Holocaust camp, concentration camps, what did you pull out of that, like, going forward for the rest of your life? I mean, you've been, been around and seen a lot of things now. Well, the whole thing was more horrible, the Holocaust, than I thought. Okay. I mean, we, we heard a lot about the Holocaust, and you learn to believe some. Remember, we had a lot of propaganda, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, we knew that Jews were being killed, others were being killed, but not to the extent that we saw them. Yeah. Our division couldn't handle it. We had a lot of doctors, but there so, were so many dying people in yeah. there. Luckily, some other infantry divisions got there. We took all of their medics. I don't think they cleaned out that place for a month yeah. or more. Wow. I was there for about a month. And then I moved on. I was working at a, at a rest camp and all that kind of stuff. But I, I can't, I really don't have words to tell you. All right. It was uh, the most horrible thing I ever saw. And they were everywhere, just dead people in piles and sometimes piled up against the wall, sometimes lying over. You had to step over dead people when just to see the place. Well, listen, I've had you for over an hour, and I want to respect your guys' time. And Alec, thank you so much for facilitating. What, what what have you pulled out from getting to know your grandpa for your whole entire life and talking to this incredible man? What have you learned? You know, it's so funny. Uh, as a kid, I totally took it for granted. But then as I just met so many other uh, American millennials who didn't have what I have, who didn't have. I mean, they might have had veteran grandfathers who were in the war, but were maybe less talkative and bottled all of the memories up yeah. or, or just sort of didn't overlap with their grandparents. I've just come to really, really treasure it and also understand the importance of engaging in the world and, and just sort of staying active and, and really trying to ask ourselves, what were the conditions that produced that tragedy? Yeah. And are they... Could they happen again? Are they happening again? Yeah. So the awareness of that, I think. We believed some of the stories we heard. We knew there was propaganda. But I'll tell you, our guys were shooting down those German guards just when they saw them. Yeah. Outside of there, one time my squad leader and I were walking around the area, and we saw a gang of people doing something. We didn't know what, so we went over there. And they had a... He was obviously one of the guards, and they were at a at a fire escape that went up the side of the building. So up on the second floor, there were guys up there. And they had a chain around this guy's neck. Mm. They'd pull him up till he's almost dead, and then they'd let him down and pull him up. We said, "Look, we know how bad it is, but you don't murder people like that." We took him as a prisoner, turned him over to the MPs. Yeah. If I caught somebody doing something, I would have shot him. But I didn't always catch him in the act. And I don't know what he did. Yeah. I mean, he was in German uniform, scared as hell. Right. I wasn't going to shoot him just like that. I mean, He'd get his day in court or whatever. Right. And uh, a lot of them were executed afterward. Sure. And sure. there was the SS. We, we kept the SS for a year. A whole year yeah. in prisons, in prison camps. The Wehrmacht, we said, just get out of here. Yeah. They had kids there. They had kids shooting us since they were 13 years old. Right. At the end. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't going to just shoot them. Sure. The kids were crying. Right. In a uniform, you know. They put these guys, you know what a Panzerfaust was? Mm-mm. Uh, it was like a German bazooka. Okay. Only I shot a huge grenade, and it shot it maybe 60, 70 feet. 
and you shot it and it would knock down a house practically or it would right. knock a tank out. Um, they give these kids a poncer foss. They said, you get here and you're at this intersection of highway, you can get in the ditch and you, you shot these, shoot these American tanks. Well, they were so close. They shot the, the explosion of these things. Yeah. It was like a big bomb going on. Right. The kids, I saw a lot of kids in uniform, they're just crying. Yeah. They were young, just the young kids. And I said, geez, I think when I was that age, yeah. I mean, we were young, but not that not young. Not that young, right. Yeah. 14, 15 years old. Saw them all the time. They put everybody in uniform. Right. They even put women in uniform. Hmm. Now, I don't know how, if they used them in combat, but they were in our little prison camps. Yeah. In fact, my buddy and I met a couple of girls when I was at a, the rest camp, and they're still in German uniforms. And we got a case of beer. I I had to do the running the guys that were there as yeah. as guests. I was part of the, the uh, what do you call it, the staff. So I was running motorboats. Mm-hmm. And I had a big French outboard motor. Well, there's my picture there, running it in that lower right-hand picture. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm running it. You can see the castle in the background. That was our home. Yeah. And that was a rest camp where we were getting the best food you could imagine. Finally. We couldn't believe it, you know. So those, those are the stuff. good memories is when it, the GIs were basically running yeah. Europe. And they it got looks to like, like you went from cold and not enough clothes to warm and comfortable and not wearing clothes. Sunbathing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I knew where it was. I was at, um, we were at the Traunse, which is another one of those long lakes. And, you know, that was, I was had the motorboat. All I had to do was got to take the guys around, you yeah. know, a little bit. We had all the fresh food from the States, all the beer, all the ice cream. And we were engineers, so we ran the motorboat thing. Yeah. And this is the one thing I uh, volunteered for. <laughs> so I took a shell 14 feet long, and I one of the pictures on there, the kid I was with, I couldn't get in the barrel, but he was small enough. One of those pictures right on the desk. There should be one of a no. of a young guy. There it is. Sit, yeah, there he is. I had met him, and he's the one he told me. He said, hey, there's supposed to be a big cannon back in the woods. I said, let's go find it. This is a month after the war is over in Bavaria. I have never seen anything like that. Yeah. That, that thing, uh, I read later the statistics on it. They could shoot a, this big shell, 14-foot long shell. Yeah. 20 miles. Wow. And one of those things would knock a whole city block out. Yeah. But who ever heard of artillery that big? Well, Hitler had to have the biggest. Yeah. It's hard to see it was dark in that afternoon in the woods. And I didn't have the best camera in the world. And there were some of the Russians we liberated. And But when, when we back, went back to the rest camp, or where our rest camp was, yeah. We went back, and I found the same spot that we were in in the first picture. That's the same spot on the deck, yeah. the brand-new deck. This was a swimming camp and a restaurant and so on. Yeah. And uh, so I found the, the same location when we took that picture. How many years apart? A lot of years. <laughs> yeah, a lot of years. This is, that's my squad there, plus the guy that took the picture. We're having drinks after, this is in California. We were, you ever hear of ASDP, Army no. Specialized Training? No, uh-uh. They sent a whole bunch of us that we'd been in college. They sent us back to college in uniform. In uniform, okay. So we were all in uniform, and the guys came from all over the country, and they did it for several reasons. They wanted to have guys that could speak languages. We had language classes, and... Uh, some other thing, and it was a big, big idea that didn't pan out because they needed bodies. Yeah. But for nine months, I was out of the war in Santa Clara University in uniform Yeah. and going to San Francisco every weekend and having a ball. So here we are later when I was in back in the real army again. Now we're in the 11th Armored Division in camp, but we could get passes and 
these uh, these golf clubs were still open, but nobody playing because there's no gasoline, you yeah. know. So here we are. We get our drinks at the bar, and we take them out and take a picture of us. So those are the guys that I was the closest to, plus the guy that took the picture, all during that AST Army yeah. Special Ace training. Well, that's cool. It was a big idea that was fine. It didn't really work out because they needed bodies on the firing line. Sure. But I'll tell you what, it probably saved my life. And that's, yeah. you were, you were, in that because you were an engineering student and they put you in there or? Uh, or yeah, you... I was in engin engineering. They needed engineers and language people. It was a big idea, it didn't work. Yeah. That what they needed was bodies, bodies and behind a machine gun or something, that's, which is what I did. Well, Chet, well, thank you so much for sharing time with us. Well, it's such a yeah. big story and I, I just, I know everybody's gonna love hearing from you and, and yeah. you know, it's just, it's great to, that's great to be able to share time with you, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Alec, for also. For yeah, thanks so much for doing so the work good. you do. And a, uh, an associate producer note for Mike Van's story, my lifelong friend, we uh, upset this up. 